wearing uh, ammunition belts. Ammunition belts. <laughs> what else? No, yeah, put in oh, yeah. Um, I see a um, tower. Mm. I see, uh, I like how the, the amulet and necklace sort of represents like Egyptian mm -hmm. in the back. Right. The one in the back. Figure in the back. Yeah, figure out right yeah, here. Yeah, the mm -hmm. necklace. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right here? Yeah. Okay. That's the actual symbol. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What about the positioning of the three figures? What can we take from that? each other's back. If you think about the title for a second, The Wives of Shango, what do you think is the meaning behind that? Are people know who Shango is? I can't see any hands. No, I don't. You can see hands. I can't see hands. Yep. Are they, are they wearing firearms? Yes. Mm -hmm. Are those gun belts? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, I got, I got that part, but I just saw the straps mm -hmm. the guns and the bags coming up the bags. <clears throat> you want to go take a stab? Mo and Michaela. Mo, Michaela? Oh, well, I know Sean Go. My understanding is that he's one of the gods in the recent pantheon. Mm -hmm. So I'm really getting Trinity from it, like a holy Trinity yeah. action. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right, getting back again. Sean Go, one hand, again. Returning back to Africa. But Africa, again, is oftentimes represented as pre colonial. Africa before European intrusion. The Africa in some cases that also kind of remains kind of static and unchanging. But in Africa where they're looking to again other sources of inspiration for self-determination. So in this case you were talking about pre-colonial African religions. Or I, I, I tried not to use the word traditional because I have some problems with it. So I'm trying to use pre-colonial just to make it a little bit more accessible. And that essentially, but we really go back to even before the, the slave trade in a lot of ways. But really, again, this looking back and this remembering of, or, try, or this remembering and remaking of what we were or thought we were before the rupture, before the Middle Passage. In some cases, too, it's given, of course, but a kind of contemporary blending taking place where time collapses. The fact that you're talking about modern day warfare, modern day weapons. Uh, but then also the gender component is something that I feel like is very interesting in the sense that oftentimes you're also going to see, and again, I can't show you all these images, but Again, the representation of the woman as a warrior figure as well. Oftentimes, I will go back to this element. A woman is seen as Oftentimes, the woman is still uh, seen as a warrior figure. Uh, you'll see a number of imagery of the mother, usually with the child. But even the title itself even presents a role of the woman as protector. But even the wives of the Shango, again, bringing it back to pre-colonial kind of uh, African culture, this idea that African culture and this idea of polygamy, uh, having multiple wives, is something that was revisited and reclaimed and brought back to the present during that time. Uh, and even celebrated. Not only celebrated because of the revolutionary character, but in some ways the guy in the middle, even him being almost uh, a little bit elevated in the position of a kind of authority that I think is important. Because as we get to the, some of the critiques, and the critique that I'm trying to get at a little bit is the Africa in the African American imagination or the black arts imagination as being somewhat problematic, um, at the, while the same time liberating, but uh, I'm also kind of getting into some of the problems within the Black Arts Movement. If you go back to the Baraka poem that I started off with, and the ways in which he was talking about 
whites, ways in which maybe he was talking about Jews, the ways in which uh, we see artists beginning to talk about uh, uh, gender relations in very kind of, uh, what do say, kind of archaic ways. Um, black arts movement has gotten a lot of criticism for being almost hypersexist, hypermasculinist, um, as well as uh, homophobic. Uh, so these things are important. And in some cases, there's an image of empowerment, where I agree with a lot of people too, but then there's also a reinforcement of relations and gender relations that we need to actually interrogate in this kind of remembering uh, process that these artists are involved with. Africa. This is done by Nelson Stevenson, 1971, called Uhuru. Nelson Stevenson said that he uses the multiplicity of colors in this piece to represent the kind of syn syncretism of African American culture and identity. Because of the Middle Passage, because of the slave trade, because of the forced dispersal of peoples throughout the diaspora, is that they begin to interact with other peoples from different cultures. If you think about slave trade as not just the dispersal of Africans, you're talking about the dispersal of Shishanti. You're talking about the dispersal of the Yoruba. You're talking about the dispersal of West Central Africans. You're talking about a number of people that didn't necessarily knew how to communicate. And what you have is a blending. And so what Nelson Stevenson was talking about is that these colors all represent the, all these elements that make up the African American experience. But what's interesting is where Huru is placed. If you think about this being kind of a representative of Huru inside the mind, I'm thinking freedom. But the different element too is the language in which we see it. Uh, another interesting thing that we see with um, visual art is that when Stevens produced Uhuru in 1971, he's attempting to illustrate a cultural syncretism that made up the African American identity as a result of forced dispersal. Yet is the strategic placement of the term Uhuru, he Swahili for freedom, in what would be the location of the brain. To, one's, uh, to free one's mind is to think Uhuru, not freedom. And by that, I mean to use political concepts culled from uh, non-Western uh, languages to articulate one's black nationalist politics. The learning of Kiswahili, which uh, became the national language of Tanzania, a country seen as a model of nation building for African Americans during the 60s, took on a particular, particularistic ideological import. This idea of naming, the idea of using African languages, we're all, again, in these efforts to construct a black nationalist identity. The reason why Kiswahili was so attractive, in addition to Tanzania being this country that was doing an African socialist experiment, it brought in African Americans that said, come to Tanzania and help build the nation. You guys will let you, uh, you know, set up shop, do whatever you want to do. You have this dedication. Tanzania was one of few countries in Africa that African Americans were going to. First it was Ghana. After the coup in 1966, it saw the overthrow of Nkrumah from power. A whole bunch of African Americans were there at the time, had to leave, and they were continually searching for a real site, a real place in Africa that they could refer to as home. And what you get here is that same sort of um, idea. This idea of making a connection to uh, not only Africa, but making a connection again to putting value on this idea of speaking non-Western languages as a way to further that connection, as a way to further that link between blackness and Africanness. The Book of African Names as told by Chief Osuntoki. Drummond Spear Bookstore and Press, which I talked about a little bit uh, before out of Washington, D.C. Again, they're also publishers. Their most popular book for a dollar was a Book of African Names. The Book of African Names was based on the research done by the uh, by the uh, editors of Drum Spear Press, who were master students in uh, African history at the time. As master students, they ended up pulling together names from all different regions of Africa, southern, eastern, northern, western, and they put it in this book. As told to by Shifa Sintoki, if you read the preface to the book, they talk about traveling into the village, and meeting up with this old sage elder who told him the history of Africa and telling African Americans that they need to uh, identify with or even adopt an African type of personality. The interesting kind of caveat here is that this guy did not exist. Chief Osuntoki did not exist. Chief Osuntoki was made up by these two uh, students, master students and editors of Drumsphere Press. And when I interviewed them about five years ago, because I asked the question, so 
tell me about the story. How'd you go with the chief also told me? He just started laughing at me. He's like, ah, we made that up. Um, <laughs> and it did. It's really interesting. And he said, you know, at the one hand, we made it up because at the time, the atmosphere at the time is that people were such a craving new identities, mm -hmm. making this connection to Africa, whether it's on a very